Okay, that mic's plugged in. <laughs> Welcome to the Virtual Stab Comedy Theater. Hey, Mean Dave's there. All right. <laughs> it's time for the Suzette Benetti Show. Please, uh, as soon as I... I can never do it clean. <laughs> Welcome to your screen. Suzette Benetti. Hi. Hey, everyone watching. Thanks for coming this week. Big show. Um, and because it's a big show... Nothing is working right. <laughs> this thing's not working. I forgot my straw. We had trouble with the intro song. I always look like this. Nothing is going our way. Um, but this is just here for looks now, and I'm going to run it off my phone. So if you're watching at home and you're like, girl, get off your phone. You have good guests and you have good contributors. I, they actually can't see me, and I can't see the rundown for the show unless I'm using my phone because technology is great until it's not, and then it's bad. So um, now you all know my secrets. That's it. That's all the secrets. And I'm not a natural blonde. And we're going to get going with the show. Because um, I don't have a monologue again. Because things don't... It, everything is the same. Like, the world's opening up. So be safe. Be careful. Um, wear the mask the right way. Cover all your holes. We covered that last week. Um, and, and be respectful of other people's space. That's six foot. Let's just go ahead and keep that. If it's a stranger, let's give them six feet. Let's give them at least three feet. There's no reason to bump into people when you're at Costco or the grocery store. You don't need to bump into me when you're grabbing bacon. You can just wait because I'm fast. I'm not, per you know, okay. Cool. I'm going to get off my soapbox on people bumping into me. Um, I just like personal space, and I think a lot of people do too, and I think we all could use that six feet going forward. Um, and on that note, I'm going to go ahead and bring in our contributor. Um, you can catch him on In the Meantime, and now that the world's starting to open back up, I don't know when his next show is, um, but maybe he'll tell us, and you should catch him in person if you can, and then you can catch him here as long as we're doing the show and he's doing it with us. Um, peers and Queers, give it up for Mean Dave. Hey. Hey, Mean Hello, Dave. Everybody. Good to see you again. Good to see you, uh, too. Sorry, all the technical difficulties that you've been experiencing. Oh. Uh, you know, seems to be one of those kinds of kinds. Of, we, we just I just uh, got finished doing uh, our Zoom live podcast of another terrible podcast by comics in isolation. And we do it as a live Zoom show. And we got our first Zoom bombers. Uh and I, I knew something was up because there was like an influx of six people all at once and all of them uh, just it, it, I didn't recognize one name. Mm. And uh, and then they all would would try to unmute themselves and try to try to talk shit or whatever. I've never had it happen yet. And I've been doing these Zoom things or any these online things for a long time. It was it was pretty exciting. It was the most excitement I've had in two months. Um, you know, that's saying and, something. Uh, I don't know if you've heard any of the stories because I, uh, I I also uh, do – I'm in recovery as I've talked about ad nauseum on this show. And uh, I've heard about the Zoom bombers in uh, recovery meetings. Uh, there's there's uh, There's been porn. There's been, uh, I think, people masturbating, which was, you know, which is porn, but like actually doing that themselves. And then there's been uh, some white supremacy. And the, uh, the white supremacy occurred in a Spanish-speaking group, which I thought was just kind of funny coincidentally. Um, but yeah, yeah. So it's, it's weird. It's weird how the zoom things, there's like people that basically, I guess they just scour the internet looking for zoom stuff to just basically start, uh, to just hijack and try to try to, and they weren't even that clever. That was the thing about it. It was, you know, at first it'd be one thing if they were funny, but they, uh, they weren't. And so we gave them a chance, but, Thanks. uh, but that didn't happen. So, um, as far as, uh, shows or anything, I don't think anything's we're, I might be doing something, the closest thing to a live show that, uh, cause pretty much I think that even after things open up, comedy is going to be like a, uh, 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 it's a last priority thing. Not to mention the fact that once they do start having shows, uh, everything's going to have all the distance. And so there's going to be less capacity, which is fine. Cause comedy's not that, I mean, even as popular as comedy can be, I don't think it's that popular. Um, which will be in the favor of the less popular comedians. I Depends think. who's doing but, it, probably. Uh, yeah, but uh, one of the closest thing to a live show that we'll be doing, um, possibly, and I'm pretty sure it's it should be a go, but uh, in like two weeks, I'll be participating in a uh, drive-in comedy show where people will be able to drive up uh, and we'll be doing a, a show where there'll be a stage and, and a microphone that'll be wired into the, uh, to the radios and uh, people tune in and then they sit in their cars and enjoy the comedy show 
uh, from their car and there'll be like a movie screen too, where the comedian will be projected onto the screen. Huh. Um, but yeah, it's not a hunt. It's, it's more than likely going to happen, but, um, but I don't want to say specifically what, uh, what it is just because I don't know if it's a hundred percent. Okay. That, that was my follow up was when and where. Um, but I mean, I think it just goes to show that like, no matter what the challenges are, like the creative people are figuring out ways to get content to people. I mean, the internet, that's the thing that cracks me up is when, when this all started, uh, you know, and, and still with comedians that are like resistant to the, to the online formats and all that, these people have been making unwatchable content for the last 10 years and I, and I'm friends, I'm part of it too. I make, you know, you can go check out in the meantime with me and Dave on YouTube and add to my, my tens of views that I, that I get, um, to any video. But, uh, but no, and it's, I have no problem. I mean, I don't want to say I had no problem. I wouldn't have thought to do it had, it, had I not been invited to, to do some stuff. But um, but it's been really funny to watch people that I know have made, you know, they've made sketches, they made all kinds of crap. And then uh, when it came to this thing, they just were like, I, I just don't get it. This this thing, I don't I don't really, uh, I, it's just not stand-up comedy and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, yeah, so what? Just talk to your camera and act like a jackass and you'll be fine. So, um, I don't know if you have anything to do or if you're going to watch the whole show tonight, but um, one of my guests, uh, comic Scott Caporo, he's putting out like nightly stand up comedy. Um, oh, I know Scott. I've actually gotten to, I've got to feature for Scott. He's, he's one, he's exactly the type of person that, that I can see. He, he, he's always quick to adapt. Like, that's, that's a dude that, like, um, I think, I don't know if he's still living in England. He might still be living in England. I'm not sure. But, um, uh, I know he, he would visit after he moved, but um, no, I got to feature for him, and he's he's just a sharp dude that's always always been adaptable. Cause yeah. He, he works in radio. He works in you know he he does what just smart guy and just he's never uh, not a closed mind. No, so. yeah. I mean it's 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 really the converse of the first couple comics I had on the show. You know, I had like, and, and I I actually side with those comics, so I'm not saying they're wrong, but like Saul. Oh, um, they're wrong. No, I'm just <laughs> Saul, you're wrong. Um, no, but I mean, Saul's doing the the Zoom shows now, so he must have found a way to do it. I get it. the reluctance. I get the. Re I believe me. I I wouldn't have. I would say that I wouldn't have if it wasn't for. Here's the thing that always helps. If you do a show and it pays, that's all that. <laughs> you throw some money at a comic, they'll you know even if the show sucks, they'll be like, oh, that wasn't so bad. Um, and that's that's just kind of the nature of the the hustle of of you know aspiring stand-up comedians so and um but i i did a show that was more we did it more of like a a a panel style and and it worked out really well and the audience was was way into it and they tipped us very generously and so then after that that's when i got the gears turning of like oh let's do this not so much to make money but just i can do this incorporate my podcast and then i i collaborate with another comedian nina g and we do a we do a show every thursday that's a comedian show and tell. And uh, we've just been doing stuff. I mean, and it's it's not just to keep busy either. They're inspired ideas. Um, and I think that's the thing is uh, if, yeah, if you're if you're really just, you know, going to, you know, keep your ground or your feet to the ground and not budge of like, this isn't stand up the way stand up should be and da 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 da, da. Yeah, uh, you know, more power to you if you can, if you can resist uh, the urge to want to entertain via other means. But but um, but I've seen people kind of be I would say kind of dealing with the with the uh, quarantine better who uh, are just open to the outlet and just yeah who, you know my my thing is there to lose? I I don't think I'm a good enough comedian to do it I think that there are people that are good enough to do stand up over Zoom Scott being one of them um, or Instagram in his case um, I just think it's it's understanding the difference in the medium you have to adjust for the medium. And this isn't a stage with people looking right at you. And I think a lot of people are treating it like funny, that. Funny thing is, you know, there's been people I've gotten to perform to, to no laughter before, <laughs> both live and uh, and I was at a, at a studio. There was a place, Marin TV, where they do uh, they do like a, a, a studio audience type thing. And it's small, it's a small group. And they're not loud laughers and uh, and had a lot of fun watching comics just perform their jokes to the void on that television, you know, program. And, uh, I think just experiences of just, you know, yeah, I always say like, you know, I don't always do comedy for laughs. Sometimes I do it for the thoughtful peace and quiet after my jokes. And, and so it's, 
kind of like doing that. Like if you can just perform confidently, whatever it is that you're doing, uh, you know, who's to say what's a joke and what's just a rant, you know? So that's a good point. And, um, yeah, I don't know if you need confidence because I sure perform a lot and I don't know if there's a lot of confidence there, but I think it does help um, when people have it. Um, you so, keep coming back each week, so I'd say that's confidence enough. So. Confidence or stupidity? Um, Either one. That's fine. Also, when you look this good, you just have to keep coming back. Damn right. <laughs> um, well, thanks, Mean Dave. Um, Thank anything you. else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. Check out In the Meantime with me and Dave on YouTube if you haven't already. Oh, and really quick. Uh, you got your first Venmo tip from our show. Oh, it, last week. Yes, I did. Yeah. $6.90 from Brian. Oh, okay. Thank you. That is Thank not. Thank you very much. That was, that was, that was wonderful. I, and I, I liked how, uh, I liked how you, you asked, like, why the $6, why the 90 cents? I said 69. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a, it's the number. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's kind of, duh. My brain's you know? not there usually, but um, no, I, I'm, I'm bummed that it wasn't my ex's attorney. I wish I wish it had been a tip from him. Um, I know you really want to get that attorney money. I, I re- but, yeah. Well, yeah, I just think he just he says I'm making all this money, so let's let's share it. You know, let's get it to my contributors. Um, all right, cool. We'll come back next week. Thanks for thanks for hanging out for a couple minutes and Thank talking. You. And, and Robert, I have no problem coming back each week. All right, Robert, best don't be bothering Suzette. I love doing this show, so. Thanks again. I'll see you next week. Uh, well, I should tell Mr. Bess, um, I just mentioned what you said to Dave, and he knew who it was from, but um, I, didn't, I didn't tell him who it was from. Um, anyhow, uh, going to move on to uh, my next guest. Um, he brings the tea every week, and hopefully this week it's, well, I know what it is. It's, it's pretty hot tea. Um, Clifton, can you hear me? Yes, I can. How you doing, Suzette? I'm all right, except for this not working and this not working. Um, I'm okay. Oh, baby girl, you fine. Oh, you thank know you. You're fine. Thank you. You know, you're fine. You know, I'm over here drinking, living my best Sunday life, and we're going to talk about some foolishness that happened this week. You know, our favorite Xanax cocaine living her best summertime sadness life girl lana del rey just had to show her motherfucking ass this week so lana del rey who is a sad girl music maker she had to log on instagram and type something that really just brought a lot of to her and you know some people have the mentality of all publicity is good publicity but this was not it And basically what it was, Suzette, was that she was mad because she has not had a number one hit in a while. So she went on Instagram and she said this, I'll give you a little excerpt and then I'm going to read the bitch after this shit. So she said, question for the culture. What culture, girl? And so she said, now that Doja Cat, Ariana, Camila, Cardi B, Kalani, and Nicki Minaj and Beyonce have had number ones with songs about being sexy, wearing no clothes, fucking, cheating, etc. Can I please go back to singing about being embodied, feeling beautiful by being in love, even if the relationship is not perfect, or dancing for money, or whatever I want, without being crucified or saying that I'm glamorizing abuse? Girl, if you don't shut your ass up. So she had the audacity to get on Al Gore and Beyonce's internet and say these lies because it's just like most of the artists that you named have been crucified for their artistic work. And I'm just, I'm just like, Lana, did you forget that Beyonce went on the Super Bowl stage in Black Panther garments and sang Formation? had a lot of racist white people mad at her for years? Did you not forget that Ariana Grande when they bombed her concert was facing death threats for that? And did you not forget that also when her ex-boyfriend committed suicide that she was facing a lot of grief for that? Like I understand that all these women have made songs that were sexual but also all these women have also made songs that have 
pinpointed very big highlights of their life or highlights of the time that was going on, whether it was the the Black Lives Matter movement or suicide or anything like that. And it's just like, her whole thing was very tone deaf. And of course she rightfully was read on the internet. And then she gave some half-assed apology talking about don't call me Karen. I'm like, girl, you can't say don't call me Karen when you pull the most Karen is smooth ever. Like, I don't know what to tell you, Lana. Like, maybe if you stuck a pussy up and create a hit that's not a sad girl song. And the, the fact that you have the audacity to write this, but you have a song that says, My pussy tastes like Pepsi Cola. Mine Your pussy tastes like Pepsi Cola. Mine for sure doesn't. I know that. You know, like, 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 make it make sense, Lana. You know, pick, pick a side, pick a, pick a, pick a thing, because I feel like you want to be victim, but you don't know what type of thing that you want to be a victim of, and it's just like make it make sense. So, yeah, she's rightfully been read, and it has been hilarious reading everyone's shading of her which is rightfully so now but you, in, oh, go ahead. in the positive news is that um have you checked out lady gaga and aaron grande's song i haven't yet i was working on on the show and i didn't get a chance to watch it it's so good it is so good and honestly yeah. like chance i won't listen to it it'll make you feel good and like it will also kind of make you miss going out because the song really makes you feel like, oh my God, I want to go out to the bars. I want to see, like, in my mind, I can imagine Helen Hills and someone else performing that song. And it just, it just brightens my mood, brightens my spirit. And it makes me miss my girls. Like, but that La Del Rey stuff, girl, mm -mm. and it's just like, stop playing the victim. Well, you like you sit here and you act like you are on the cross because Beyonce, believe it or not, only has six number one singles in her whole career. Six. That's it. Six. That doesn't sound like enough. And Britney Spears, if you want to believe it or not, Britney Spears only has one, two, three, four number one singles in her whole career. Wow. But you don't see Britney and Beyonce going on the internet and talking mess about others and things like that. You know what they're doing? They're focusing on their, they're staying in a lane and are giving us the best they can give us. Well, and oh, go ahead, sorry. That would be the equivalent of me getting mad at DJ Pocket for having a wonderful show that you guys need to check out. But that would be the equivalent of me shading him for having success. And I feel like a lot of these new girls, they need to learn that you can get respect and you can get success without having to shade others. You know, like there are many people that can do things better than me. And besides the shading them, why don't you learn from them? Why don't you ask them for advice? Why don't you say, hey sis, how did you do this? How did you do that? And I feel like Lana Del Rey, besides the saying that, has she a DM Lady Gaga or Beyonce or any of them? They're like, hey, girl, how'd you do this? She'll do better, but she done fucked it up. So in the words of Monique from Charm School, when you do clownery, the clown comes back to bite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know it too. <laughs> okay, so two things um, that I want to mention, and maybe one of them we'll talk about next week. And then the, the other one is just a follow up to what you said. So the first one is, so mm -hmm. Lana, Lana Del Rey shaded Doja Cat. But then I noticed, I saw a story where Doja Cat is in some hot water. Um, Girl. She's steeping because she did some things. So let's, <gasps> let's save that for next week. Um, we can talk about Don't Doja Cat if you want. Because Doja, bitch, you ain't off the docket. Doja Cat's on the docket too, girl, because she done fucked it up too. But, mm. Well, I know, I know. And the second one is I'm gonna take your I'm gonna take your suggestion 
It wasn't mm-hmm. really a suggestion to me, but I've been bugging Helen, like, Helen, let's do a duet. Let's do a duet. Because you need to have someone that can dance to take all the um, all the focus off of someone that can't. So I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna suggest to her in in the interview right here next uh, that we just go ahead and debut that song. So <laughs> I will say this though, mm-hmm. you know, because Ariana Grande, I feel like she went to the school of Mariah Carey when it comes to dancing because Ariana Grande is more about the voice than the moves. But, you know, she she held on to her own. And I feel like with you, Suzette, I feel like if you know, if you get to learn your steps, I feel like you, you'll, you'll shock the girls, too. Everything doesn't need to be a shablam and a death job. I feel like you can give us some some cute little eight counts that would get the girls gagging. I got things up my sleeves for when we come back. Yeah. I, and I feel like I feel like you got it in you. So, you know. Thank you. Thank you. And I live right next door to you. So, you know, you ain't got to. Just say the word, girl. I'll be over there, and I can give you some some dance moves in the alleyway because of social distancing. You know? Right, right, right. Oh, I was gonna say you're probably gonna hear you're probably gonna hear that new song bopping from my apartment tonight when I get home and I'm in the shower. Thank you for coming and spilling some tea. Yes, you know I love I love me some you, and I love everybody here. So I love you thank too. You so much for having me. Okay, see you next week, Clifton. Bye. Bye. Okay. Peers and Queers, that's Clifton, and you can follow him on all his social medias, um, and uh, he's a DJ and a good friend of mine. And um, next, we're going to go with an interview, going to interview uh, a queen, local, a, a Northern California superstar. You can catch her wherever you can. Uh, I don't know if drag's coming back quite yet, um, but when it does, you can catch her at Fridays Are a Drag, and you can catch her in the drag brunch that we are both performers in, Makeup and Mimosas, um, and then you can catch her here at Stab Comedy um, with uh, Fierce, Fresh, and Fabulous, um, and then a lot of other places, because she is busy, and we're going to find out how busy she is and has and been during the quarantine. Peers and Queers, Helen Heels. Hi. Hi, how are you? Hi, I'm gravy. You're you're gravy? Yeah, like what you put on potatoes. Okay, I thought you said crazy, and I was like, what'd I do? (laughs) Oh, no, that's you. I wouldn't take your your shtick. Don't take my gig, Helen. Um, So what have you been up to during the quarantine? Um... Nothing. (laughs) That's okay. Work. I mean, I'm still working, and um, I not drag my like real job, and um, I don't know. I've been doing like digital drag shows, but for the most part, I've been like trying to organize other thing, but I can't talk about it yet. Okay. Yeah. Will Will you announce what this other thing is when there's another thing? When of When it's ready, where will you announce that? everywhere (laughs) okay cool so people can just follow you on the social i don't know which side it's on the social media is under your picture and they can find the announcement there okay cool so you you've been performing in virtual drag shows how does that differ from real life drag shows i mean beside the obvious um at first it was fun like it was a great way for people to i feel like get creative and i mean holy crap it opened the floodgates for a lot of people to be able to um, perform because normally you would have to like wait for gigs or you'd have to like, you know, kind of work your way up for deep ones. Like anybody and everybody put on like a digital drag show, which is good because we got to see some showcases from some girls that normally wouldn't. Um, But quickly everybody got really creative with the camera and digital drag shows have popped up a lot. Right. So it, kind of became more of a competitive market than like an actual drag show that's interesting because i i noticed the same thing that like everybody has a show everybody's hosting um and it's it kind of it it not that there was gatekeeping before but like you don't have to check with anybody you can just start your own show on instagram and just do it yeah Mm -hmm. and i know that I certainly am still working my way up to try to get booked in, in the real world um, and still trying to get better and, and catch the right attention of the bookers and all that. So that is an interesting take that you have. Um, 
What uh? Let's see. How long have you been doing drag overall? Oh, are we gonna do the um, first time interview questions? No, no, just that, that. Just that. Well, just how long have you? Because I have a question follow up. Um, I would say that I've done it now for six to seven years. Okay. Yeah. And how has drag overall? Obviously, virtu- the last few months have been virtual. So let's not even figure that. But how has drag changed in the six or seven years since you've been doing it? What, like, in your, from your standpoint, how has drag overall changed? Um, I will say that it's a lot more accessible to new queens on the scene. Like, a lot of queens, when I first started out, were like, oh, I was doing this for Halloween, or, um, if my friend wanted me to do it, or I was in a contest. Um, and there wasn't, there was no YouTube tutorials. There was no like immediate like access to clothing. You would have to like find an old drag queen and have them make you stuff. You would have to get very like crafty by yourself. I feel like nowadays um, when I meet a new queen, they just have so much access to everything. You can literally learn your face you can learn how to sew, you can learn how to stone, you can learn how to make mixes. You can learn so much just from a day of watching YouTube. So you learn the old way. You you just had to teach yourself everything and learn from people that had done it. Yeah, trial and error. But to me, trial and error is like the best way to learn because it teaches you the importance of failing and not the cookie cutter right away because if you start out and you do one tutorial and all of a sudden your face looks like raven okay wonderful you you know how to draw somebody else's face but i don't know anything about you. i don't know about your struggle about your successes i just know that you know how to follow other people's directions and you're a drag queen that's a good point um so do you, would you advise to anyone starting new now? Like if somebody came up to you and they were like, hey, I'm going to get started with drag in 2020, would you say, look, don't take advantage of all the tutorials. Learn the right way, the old way. Uh, no, I, I mean, I, I encourage, unfortunately, I do still tell people like, go on YouTube, take a few lessons. But what I want them to know is like, I want them to know that it doesn't have to all just be immediate everybody wants to be a drag queen and they want to be booked and they want to dig within their first month of being. and that teaches you absolutely nothing about this crap because if you do if you look ultra feminine and you you padded and you put your waist in and you don't wear tits you wear a long pass and pull your face and you you know you don't give yourself the opportunity to grow and if you if within the first month and everybody's like okay cool and then there's nothing else to do that's because you literally like you got everything cooking to you and now you to show for yourself somebody else so i i'd say like don't do the struggle because it'll teach you how to become more of an effective performer you look great on it but that's not always going to translate on stage. You know I mean? Yeah, I mean that's that's something that I've I've definitely learned doing stand up comedy is is like I don't want to rush into being. I mean, it's not that I have a choice because I'm not that good, but I don't want to rush into trying to be somebody's feature or trying to headline myself. There, that's not even a, a, a tangible goal for me at the moment. Like the best goal for me is like how can I do the best if I get an opportunity in a show and get five minutes how can i be the best i can in those five minutes and then in stand-up hosting is kind of like the first level and so it's like how can i be the very best host i can um and and a lot of people want to skip those steps in stand-up comedy and it's like why would you want to skip those because those you learn valuable lessons about how to control a crowd or how to function and if you don't know those lessons then you it's going to show eventually and I think that's kind of what you're saying with, with skipping steps in drag. Yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm working without technology. Um, okay. What is the coolest thing about doing drag? Um, 
for me, the coolest thing is probably just just like a comedian, since we're relating everything back to comedians. Um, it's about entertaining and like seeing the joy of other people. You do it for yourself, but it's sort of, um, I think there's an, a level of involvement where if you put out something nice, I just realized my little turbans were, um, I feel like if you entertain people and you make them happy, you're doing like a service. You're doing like a public community service kind of thing and their happiness creates your happiness. So it's like your what you're putting out is really kind of for you, but you're doing it through other people. Make sense? Yeah. What's the okay, what's the worst thing about it? Getting in drag. <laughs> How long does it take you? If you don't mind me asking. This took me 20 minutes because I was I know that I'm not in like the best lighting. I was I've been doing makeup for a couple of days and it's been like driving me crazy and my skin's probably going to burn off. But um, it takes me normally two hours. That's what I like to give myself. Um, what's the longest you've ever been in drag in one day? All day. Um, probably from like eight in the morning till seven at night. Seven or eight. Oh, wow. Okay. So like a good 11 hours? Yeah, I mean, when we did Rainbow Fest last year, I had to arrive at um, Sidetracks for the call at 11 a.m., which means that I needed to get up at like 7, start getting ready by 8, drive up an hour to get there, get up in the room, get dressed, and then be down there. And then I, I had the daytime shows and then Sidetracks and then my own show right afterwards. So I was in drag technically, from nine to two the next morning. That, yeah, I did um, from 9 a.m. until two the next morning. So that's like 16 hours-ish. I mean, my math is off, but whew, okay. Any tips if anyone has a long day in drag? Um, hydrate, hydrate yourself, hydrate your skin. Um, carry your, take your makeup with you because I had to redo my makeup twice that day, and that's because I danced a lot. Um, I was in one of those battles, and I made it all the way to the end, so I literally times in a row. So um, uh, bring your makeup with you. And just like stay fed, stay hydrated, and um, you know, plenty of setting spray, plenty of hair spray. Setting spray is the best friend. Um, okay, are you, I have questions from the viewers, if you're ready. Um, I have two questions from Taryn in Sacramento. What? The first no one questions. is, who is the one queen you're the most scared of? Not Taryn. Hmm. Um, scared of? Mm-hmm. To be honest with you, I don't think I'm scared of any drag queen. I think I think Taryn might have something to say about that. Um, the thing, I'm not scared of Taryn because I am. I would never be able to do anything, and I don't think she could do anything that I didn't feel was going to be like constructive. Like if she had something to say to me, it would never be like, "I'm saying this to intimidate you, scare you." You'd say, like, I'm telling you this because I want you to do better. And that doesn't scare me. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. But, oh, well, yeah, you're talking You're talking about the Taryn we get to see backstage. So Yeah, exactly. So yeah. Taryn wouldn't be that person because she's never been that way with me. But right. I don't, she, even if it was like a drag queen try to be intimidating, scared. At the end of it all, you can be intimidated or scared by a drag queen. But at the end, you say, they go home. They take off their makeup. They still have bills to pay. They still pay taxes. They still have their up and their posters. And at some point, they're also vulnerable. Otherwise, they're doing it that way. And they're not too good to not to not you know, be on the same level. Field, so be scared by anybody. Okay, well, that's a good lesson for people. Don't be intimidated. Um, the other question uh, from the viewers is, what is the worst? Oh, um, crap. I feel like this one's going to hit too close to home. What's the worst performance you've ever seen? Well, 
like ever. Yeah, I guess. Um, let me preface this by saying that there are no bad performers. There's just bad performances. We all have them. We all have our moments. Um, I'm going to say, like, I've seen some videos of some root girls, and I've seen them, like, either fall off stage, hit themselves, and stuff falls apart. And unfortunately, I feel like when you've gotten to that caliber, you should be better prepared. <laughs> okay, cool. So, I was, I was, I was terrified that was going to come back at me. Um, <laughs> uh, you, Susan, you know that you are the only person that thinks your performances are terrible. Well, I think we all have to be our own worst critic. I'm just look. I'm I think excited. I'm great. You are the first. <laughs> you are the first drag family member of mine to have on the show. Um, so this is exciting for me. Um, okay. Um, are you ready for rapid fire? Sure. Okay. What is your favorite thing about the existence of brunch? Existence of brunch? Mm -hmm. um, when you're done, you still have like a day <laughs> ahead of you. True. Um, drag name that you didn't end up using? Uh, Holly Peno. <laughs> Do you name your wigs? No. What's your favorite wig color? Ooh. Red, red or blonde. I like you in red. Um, when you put on a bra, do you clasp it in front and spin it around, or do you put it on and then stretch your arms behind your back? Nope, in the front and turn that bitch around. I think everybody does that. I think that's the secret. Um, how men. <laughs> like, women, do women do it too. Women do it. I've interviewed women and asked them the same question. Um, I know, but when women do it, they have a process of how they have to do it with their boobs in front of them. We're men. We don't have anything restricting us. Like it's so easy. So why not do it in the front? That's yeah. I mean, Chelsea's the only one, and Chelsea has restrictions in front of her. Um, how high is too high for high heels? The limit does not exist. Oh, Helen heels. Um, what is your favorite song to perform to? Ugh, that's a big question. Um, I don't know. I, I've got a lot. I, I really always performing these music or shoot. Okay. Um, what is the funniest thing an audience member has ever said to you after a show? The funniest thing an audience member has said to me after the show. Um, the girl before you is terrible. <laughs> um, if somebody is buying us drinks at the bar, what are we drinking? <laughs> Rock stars or Shirley Temples. <laughs> oh, that sounds good, actually. Um, toilet paper, hang it over or under? Over. Yes, thank you. We're making that a rule in the world. Um, favorite show or venue to perform in? Ooh, um, probably Badlands. I love, I love me a Badlands home show. Fridays are a drag. Favorite drag queen? Ever. You, however you want to define. Um, probably Raja from season three of Drag Race. Favorite drag king? Ben Flicker. Uh, or Ryder Moore or Land Insider. If you were a Disney princess, who would you be? Mulan. If I was a Disney princess, who would I be? Cinderella. Oh, thank you. Um, so I don't need to ask the next one. Do you think I'm pretty? Because Cinderella's pretty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, um, what are you most excited to do when the quarantine is lifted and we can all go out? Um, hug my friends. Hug every. I'm legit. I'm gonna try my best not to turn into a mess and a puddle for every person I see that I haven't seen and never take the advantage of seeing them again and hugging them again. Well, I can't wait to get a hug. Um, thank you, Helen, for coming on and, and spending some time and your information's on bottom and people should definitely follow you. Um, oh, and I have a note um, from Pocket. He's watching the show. Um, trial and error is important because more than teaching you what works and what doesn't, it teaches you the reasons why things work and don't. 
That's why that is a smart little man. <laughs> um, well, thank you, and I can't wait to see you soon, and hopefully when all this is over, uh, that first brunch back is going to be amazing. Oh, it will. We're, we're going to burn the house down. Oh, yeah. Okay. Love you. I love you, too. Thanks for that. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody, that was Helen Heels. She is an amazing performer. Make sure you catch her live if you can watch her anywhere online. Do that. Um, it's worth the watch and worth the time. Like I said, Northern California drag superstar. Um, and with that, we're going to get to my next interview. Uh, he is my first guest with a Wikipedia page, international star of the stage and film, comedian Scott Caporo. Scott, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Hi, how are hey. you? I'm all right, thank you. Great. Um, you? So, how are you? Oh, I'm okay. Thanks. Um, I did some research, and and I found out that you went to Sir Francis Drake High School. So you're you're just one degree away from the first person to circumnavigate the globe. What does that feel like? Um, exhausting, and uh, and slightly wet. <laughs> I, I'm I'm very proud of my um, high school heritage, mostly because I was almost removed in my senior year and not allowed to graduate. Oh, do you, do you want to go on with that? That sounds interesting. Well, I think I've been a bit, I, that whole year, and maybe throughout my entire high school oeuvre, I've been a bit of a prick. And then in the final year, I wrote a, what was meant to be a sort of satirical article for the high school newspaper, where I spoofed several faculty members. And I was meant to get their signature on each, you know, description of them and I only got one so I was busy getting ready for graduation sure and they printed the article and a few, a few teachers were angry and they threatened to pull me from the graduation ceremony so did you did you graduate I did not with honors but I did with my life which I was surprised by at the time and now when I look back on it I think it's the only way to go really I mean that party you know would never have surpassed a New Year's Eve party I'd gone to that year where I, I outlined the, the numbers 1981 with cocaine. So nothing could have surpassed that. Anyway. Right? It sounds like a different time, and yet it sounds like the current time. So things change, mm. and, and then they don't. Um, so this is, I don't know if you, if you caught the start of the show. Me and Dave and I talked for a second. And um, some of the comedians I've had on the show – are really reticent, and me included, to do stand-up comedy um, over the internet, whether it's Zoom or Instagram. But you are a machine, sir. Like, you just pump out every night you do comedy for people on Instagram. Yes, I'm on tonight in 10 minutes. Oh, no, we got to get through this. I'm sorry. It's all right. I should have had you on earlier. Um, so what's, is, is there a difference for you between doing it um, on Instagram or doing it live? Well, yeah, of course. It's, 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 it might be similar to if you're a student getting a live university education now as opposed to one on, online, you know. Um, you can still achieve stuff online without an audience, but obviously there's no intimate connection. I think the one thing about stand-up comedy people really enjoy is, is the intimacy between the performer and the audience. Uh, what, whatever's created in the room is so immediate. And I think for Instagram, it's fantastic. It's a great profile, a great platform, but most people later. So they're seeing something that's already happened. And that's great with film and most TV. And it's great to read a book three or four times in different places. But I think where stand-up's concerned, the immediacy is what people crave. So I look forward to going back to that. Okay, so then this isn't like a shift for you where you're going to keep doing Instagram comedy every night. Like, you want to get back in front of people. Well, if Instagram allows me, and I'm not quite sure right now, but if they do allow me to continue, I, I happily will. I do travel a lot uh, internationally as a comic. Puff, mm -hmm. puff, get her. But I do, because I have to, because i got to go where the work is. And it would be lovely to be in a place like Holland working, where I just was in, in, in February, and be able to do live shows in California, maybe one or two nights a week. So actually what this is doing is teaching a lot of performers, musicians, comedians, live performers, you yourself, a way to reinvent ourselves, which is what live performance has always been about. 
you know? Yeah. I will never not do this. And I was doing a bit of it before the pandemic just to promote live gigs. But now I think for a while at least, this will be part of my uh, live performance cachet. I look forward to it actually. I like the idea of being elsewhere and just turning on the camera and doing a show for people 5,000 miles away. It's exciting and glamorous, I think. That's really cool, and it's something maybe for me and others to aspire to be able to do because I know with me, with comedy, it's, it's about the timing and the connection with the audience and trying to make sure that I can gauge whether or not I should go further. Um, that's something that you mm. don't seem to mind is whether or not you can go further. When I've, when I've caught you live, um, which is a total delight, um, you, you. is there a line that you don't want to cross as a comedian, or do you just go as far as you can? I haven't found that line yet. I look forward to seeing it someday from afar and then approaching it slowly on my hands and knees, but I haven't found it yet. I have said things, I must say, in front of an audience that I regretted after, but mostly that was because the few times it's happened, it was because it put me in a position of having to defend myself in a non-comedic way, which I don't like doing. I don't mind saying anything as long as it's presented in a, in a comedic platform. But if I found myself on stage apologizing for having said something or defending myself physically, that's where I know I've lost control. And I don't like that. So I usually try to stay as the ship's uh, captain and navigate. And I, I, I don't want to lose, you know, um, I don't want to lose sight of land. I want to have somewhere I'm sailing to. And to do that, I have to remember that not to take anything personally from the audience. When I do that, when I take things personally, that's when I get in trouble, you know? That's a good way to look at it. And, and I definitely don't think anyone should have to physically defend themselves. Um, so I'm sorry to hear that well, you've had to. It's a bar and people drink. True. That's a good point. Um, yeah. one, one thing that I didn't know that in my research, you wrote a book. Um, or no, with book or a show, I'm sorry, my notes are all scattered. Um, the Truth About Gay Animals? It was a book, actually. It was a, a quite a, a, a serious scientific um, book that was turned into a documentary style TV show in Britain, which oh, okay. I hosted. So it was both. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot. I, I like that you pointed out um, when I read quotes from you about the book that it kind of challenges the um, the the thought that it's unnatural homosexuality that because if animals are doing it, it does and I you know I never really oh sorry go ahead oh no no I was sorry I was just saying you know being uh, being uh, ooh, being from Francisco. I've been growing up pretty lucky to have supportive family members. I never really thought about why, you know, I, I was queer. And then to find who were concerned with that question was at first really daunting, but then it was really refreshing to talk with them and see that, you know, there are there, there is reasonable a reasonable examination as to why the human species does what it does. We're all basically wild animals sniffing around at one another. And I like the idea that, you know, there's an explanation for something that people seem to shrug their shoulders about. It didn't really change my mind about who I was, but it certainly just... Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just listening. I think we had technical difficulties. Oh, right. No, I was just saying, it, 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 the, hosting the show didn't really change my mind about who I was, but it did make me think that there's a lot of different reasons people do what they do. And a lot of them are based on animal behavior, which is interesting. That is interesting. Um, I don't want to take up too much. I, I, wish... I know I have to go. I'm really sorry. No, no, that's OK. Maybe we can do this again. I was going to say, would you mind coming back? I'd love to. OK, great, because I have I, I have so many more questions for you. Um, I'd be honored. All right. Um, so I can ask you one more question, or I can just ask you like two okay. or three rapid fire and then let you go. Your choice. Okay. Okay. Um, let's one see. One question. One question. Um, 
I have to ask, oh, okay, here it is. Um, so we're, we're not gonna get to this today, but we can revisit this if you want. You were in A Phantom Menace, and in the credits, you were on top of Jabba the Hutt. So is it fair for me to say that you topped Jabba the Hutt? <laughs> yes, you may You may say that. That's gonna be on my, on my tombstone. Has no I one ever said that Jabba. before? Oh wow! Okay, it's a good T-shirt. I, Listen, I, thank you so much, and thank, and thank you, you so much for including me tonight. It's, it's really loads of fun. Oh, thank you so much, and and we'll, I'll message you, and we'll bring you back as soon as you can. That'd be great. I All really right. love it. Have a great show. Thank you very much. Take care. Good night. Bye. Have a good holiday with you. You too. Bye. Okay, uh, everyone watching. That's Scott Caporo, and you can find him. His information was on bottom, his Instagram handle. And he's going to go off and do a live comedy show right now. And um, you can follow him there. Um, sorry that we don't have more of him today. Um, I should have planned around that better. Uh, and it looks like no Chelsea. Okay, cool. So we'll just go with um, our always last guest, um, comedian, actor, producer, uh, whatever he's doing today, David Shapiro. David, um, can you hear me? Are you there? Yep. Cool. Have you been going out much? No. Oh. Are you excited for everything to open? Maybe. Okay. So I gave you an assignment this week um, of something to watch yes, and report on. Yes, you did. Uh, you asked that I watch she uh, Season 5 um, on Netflix. Had you seen the show before or did you oh, start with Season I, 5? Oh, um, I... I, I watched all of them. Or I had already seen them. I, I I was caught up to date on one through four. It's a it's a good show. So okay, cool. So tell the audience kind of bring um, us up to speed on okay. one through four. So it's a remake of the '80s cartoon, and on a distant planet called Etheria, um, there's a soon to be hero, our our soon to be hero, Adora, and she lives and she works with um, the the bad guys, basically uh, the evil horde. Uh, and the evil horde is mean and and they're um, nasty and and dastardly. They're a bit goofy. Uh, some of them, maybe some clumsy members, just like any big um, organization that's trying to take over and, and subjugate people. Uh, but they do seek to subjugate and dominate this magical planet, Etheria, uh, with their science. Wait, the bad guys have science? And <laughs> science the good is good, know? though. Um, yeah. This show, so science is, but in the show, I'm just saying in life, science is good. In the show, um, they have magic, and so the bad guys have science. That's not how it is in life. Okay, cool. So how does how does the story yeah. begin? And it starts one? out with Adora being on the Horde side. Um, like the first episode, though, of the series, she bumps into Glimmer uh, and Bo, uh, the Rebel Alliance leaders, and uh, there's a magical sword, and they all fight for the magical sword, and Adora grabs it, and then she turns into this eight-foot-tall, uh, magical blonde woman uh, with a skort and aggressive shoulder pads um, called She-Ra, and she is the hero of Etheria. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, uh, and she joins the about... alliance and fights for the side of good um, alongside uh, the princesses of power and Bo. Okay. Do you want to spoiler well, alert? Do you seen want to talk about now. season five? I mean, definitely seasons one through four. And season five has been out for like a week or two. So do you want to talk about so, it? Okay. So I'll try. It starts Without with season spoilers. five um, with, with uh, Glimmer and Catra, Adora's best friend slash love interest, uh, aboard the evil intergalactic uh, battle cruiser spaceship of Horde Prime, who is the ultimate villain of the series. Um and originally, we thought the villain of the series was Hordak, who was the leader of the the, the Horde on Etheria. But Hordak, uh, we find out, is actually just a flawed clone um, of Horde Prime. Mm. And so you really come to like him over the first, uh, you know, like seasons like three and four, you really start to like feel for the guy. So I think they needed a bigger bad guy. So they got Horde Prime. And Horde Prime's terrible because he just wants everyone to be a reflection of him. He doesn't like originality or anything unique or, or individualistic. So he seek, but he does have cool colors like white and, and lime green are like really good colors. Um, so he seeks to make everything a reflection of himself and no, uh, you know, originality. 
Okay. Um, and then in what yeah. what is the difference um, for season five? So in the in the in the series in season finale of season four, Adora breaks her magical sword that turns her into Shira, and now she just has to be Adora, and she thinks Shira is the hero, but she might learn that Adora is the hero and not Shira. Right? Because she's struggling to fight as like the lesser version of herself, which maybe the lesser version is the greater version. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so maybe there's the a magical the blonde lady in all of up, us. We learn mm-hmm. all sorts of things, like the, the, the themes of the show, like there are all sorts of them, like individuality is cool and people can be redeemed if they make bad choices and um, friendships are important and sometimes um, friends don't understand that we want to be their friend. Like, some friends have more trouble understanding that, Um, and people will make decisions, friends will make decisions we don't agree with, but it's okay, and and you just move on, because if you really care about each other, you can do that. Okay, so there's a magic blonde lady inside the hero, so there's... I guess, yeah, Uh, I mean, I don't know if that was an intended message, that there was a magical blonde lady living inside all of us, but that could be a takeaway, if if you want it to be, Suzette, sure. I like that thought. Um, I mean, season... <laughs> I... What? I would... I I don't think so, but may, for the sake of this segment, let's say, yeah. Let's say, sure. Okay. That there's a blonde lady inside all of us. Inside you. If yeah. there was a magical blonde lady inside me, what would her what? special skill be? Right. Um, I like to... Uh, I like to dance. I like to feel the rhythm of music and dance. So I'm going to say if there was a magical blonde lady inside me, um, dancing would be it. I don't think that'd be her special skill. Um, something tells okay. me that wouldn't work. Um, well, but what anyhow, else does season five uh, She-Ra has? Season 5 mm-hmm. is out now. Um, it's a good watch, quick episodes, uh, fun for adults, probably great for kids. I, I wouldn't know. Um but I, I imagine it'd be like phenomenal for kids. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chelsea has a kid. We should ask Chelsea, uh, get a mom opinion on that. Um, yeah, it combines fantasy and sci-fi. So something for everyone. Uh, you know, there's princesses with um, ice powers and water powers and, and, and machine powers. So, and there's a, a sea captain with shanties. Wow, it sounds like a Stefan sketch. Princess with pre- prehensile hair. Yeah, it still sounds like a Stefan well, sketch. Well, yeah, I mean, sometimes life feels like a Stefan sketch, you know? True. Oh, Well, thanks for doing it. Thanks for uh, watching. Thanks for... And reporting. Thanks for coming up with something to do. You're welcome. Okay, yeah, be safe as everything opens up. I will, you too. Right be safe if you ever... Bye, Suzette are in a show get booked bye okay cool so that is david shapiro his information was on the bottom you can follow him and i think that's going to be the show um but remember guys um if you want to support any of the interview guests or contributors their information's at the bottom of the show whether you're watching this live or if you're watching a playback um also don't forget stab comedies Uh, theater's information is at the top of the screen and you can um, donate there Um, it's just a a theater trying to stay afloat and they give people like me chances to do things like this so donate um, be safe out there have fun and uh, see you next week with megan pixel